Here's the thing that I want everyone to understand. When you get out of your comfort zone to follow Jesus, that's the key. When you get out of your comfort zone to follow Jesus, something beautiful begins to happen. You begin to experience the faithfulness of God in a new way that you hadn't experienced before. And you find out that on the other side of fear, there's a whole bunch of God that is fun to experience. Amen. And the problem is the door isn't even locked. It's just closed because it's a door called fear. And many of us limit ourselves to cross that boundary because we're scared of what's on the other side. But ladies and gentlemen, when you understand fully who God is, you stop living fear of man. You stop living in fear of the enemy because they got nothing compared to Jesus Christ. Amen. So tonight, I want to open with a very serious question, because it's a question that Jesus asked his disciples. He asked his disciples, the 12 that were right there with him, that he said, hey, who do people say that I am? And you know what's interesting is they had a bunch of answers. They said, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're Elijah. Some say you're just some prophet. But we also know that there's many times when Jesus was doing ministry that people called him Satan himself. And people called him a heretic. And people called him all kinds of horrible, evil, awful things. And you know what's crazy? Is that despite all these different opinions, it didn't change the truth of who Jesus is. And sometimes... The problem is, is that we begin to emote our life based on what we believe, even if it's a lie. You see, sometimes we we live the lie thinking that because I believe it, it makes it true. No, the, the thing that needs to happen is your belief needs to come into alignment with what is true. That's the key. And some of us, we we fall into this pit that this is your truth and my truth and your truth over there. And we're all going to be happy in one hunky-dory thing. Ladies and gentlemen, there is truth. And then there's a lot of opinions. And opinions don't make something true. But when you come into alignment with what is true, something beautiful begins to happen in your life. It's called freedom. You see, Jesus looked at his disciples, and I love it that he wasn't worried at all about what the crowd thought of him. He wasn't worried about the the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and, and their opinion of him. He wasn't trying to build a Facebook following or a Twitter following. He just looked at his disciples and said, in the midst of the noise, some people are calling me good things, some people are calling me bad things, but who do you say that I am? What about you? You've been with me day in and day out. Who do you think I am? And you know, that's that's a question that we have to answer. Because many of us, even though we, we believe that Jesus Christ is God, we limit ourselves because we don't believe that God is more powerful than the fear that we face. And so we begin to say things like, I believe God is all powerful, but I live in a cage called fear. I I say it with my mouth, but my actions and my heart prove otherwise. You see, I know that I'm going to heaven someday, and that's true if you believe in Jesus, but you still can live this life in a total cage. And that's right where the enemy wants you. If he can't keep you out of heaven, he's going to do his best to make you miserable so that you won't know who God really is. If you were here last night, you know that what we talked about was falling in love with Jesus. You know, hell is a real place and it's worse than you can ever imagine. And I don't want anyone to go there, but I want you to understand it's bigger than this. It's not about just saving you from something horrible. It's about saving you into something that is so infinitely better. And sometimes we cross the line into salvation where we believe in Jesus. We cross the line because we're afraid of going to hell and that's where we stop. And we never experience the richness of a deep relationship with God. And you know, part of the reason we don't is because we choose to live our life by fear instead of living a life outside of the box. 
You see, however you choose to answer this question, it doesn't mean that it necessarily becomes true. But what it does prove is however you answer the question, who is Jesus? However you answer that question will reveal the box that you want to make the entire Bible fit into. However you answer that question, you might say, well, I believe that Jesus was real, but he was one of many ways to heaven. And suddenly you'll find yourself putting the Bible in that box and making big excuses to jump around and and leapfrog and and skip verses and chapters and entire books. And maybe you, you look at this book and you say, that's great that that happened back then, but obviously God stopped doing those things. And if you believe that God stopped doing those things, then you're going to take the Bible and put it into that box. And all of a sudden, we have a box. And I got to tell you, the box is the problem. Is when you put it into a box, instead of coming into alignment with what is true, let me just challenge you in this. The box we design, we design because it makes us feel safe. We build a box ourselves. Uh, we, we use big words like theology and doctrine to say, I'm going to build this box and I'm going to use some scattered verses because I want to feel safe in this box. Guys, Jesus called us to be fearless. Jesus called us to trust in him with all of our hearts, minds, and souls. Amen? And tonight, we're going to get out of the box. <laughs> it's going to be a good night. I'm going to read to you something, and I want you to pay attention to your own heart. Do not take this as an attack. It's not an attack. Do not hear Pentecostal or Baptist or or Evangelical Free or anything else. Just listen to the Word of God for a second. Don't allow your mind to, to go too far this way or too far that way. Just listen to the Word of God, okay? Just listen to what it says. And then let's ask ourselves, based on how our heart responds, what is the box I'm instantly trying to put this in? You see, in Mark chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus does this. It says, and Jesus called the 12 disciples and he began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over unclean spirits, which is demons. And he charged them to take nothing for their journey except for a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Then he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake the dust off your feet and tell them this testimony. So they went out and they proclaimed the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and they were healed. Now, don't don't take this back in your box. Let's come out of your comfort zone for just a moment. I I, I want you to hear this. Listen to what Jesus was doing. He was discipling these people. He was saying, walk with me so that you can walk like me. I've been showing you these things for a while, and this doesn't come from you. It comes from me, and today I give you the authority to go and do these things. And he sent them out two by two to go and do these things. And you might think, well, that's great because the the 12 disciples were special. Well, I'm not going to deny that. If I was one of the 12 disciples that got to walk that close to Jesus, I'd feel pretty special too. But listen to what Jesus does next. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1 through 12, it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. And he sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. Isn't that cool? It wasn't just 12. He went from there to getting 72 other people that were following him and saying, you're going to do the same thing. But listen to the why behind it. He says, I'm going to send you to these places that I myself am about to go. So it's as if they got to be kind of like John the Baptist and prepare the way. They got to go and walk like Jesus and look like Jesus and have the same effect of Jesus. Listen to me, because they carried the authority of Jesus. And when they walked into a city or a town, people understood they walked in the authority of Jesus. But listen to what Jesus says next. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Whose harvest? His harvest. He says, pray for this. Pray that there will be workers that come to this place and begin to do the work with us. Because it's not about 12. It's not about 72. We need more. We need more people willing to go after the harvest. God's harvest, not my harvest. And listen to what he says next. Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter first, say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house, for whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Now, I just want to say before too many people get all weird on me in this place, that this is incredible to me. Now, I want you to take all the stuff you've ever heard and ever learned and just set it over here for a second and pretend like we're reading the word of God to you for the very first time. Because what was that like for the people that lived in these cities and all of a sudden that one of the 72 couples were coming in or maybe two of the 12 disciples were coming in and they come into your town and all of a sudden demons are coming out and, and people are getting healed. What do you think the town would begin to think? You see, we we want to believe that if that was happening in front of us, the whole city would repent and come to Jesus, and then the whole state, and then the nation, and the whole world. That's what we want to believe. But the problem is, is that didn't even happen for Jesus. And he was doing the stuff. And you want to know what I think Jesus was trying to do? He was trying to reveal that there are so many people that are unwilling to receive what he wants to give them. Because think about this. If people came into your city or your town and you'd never heard the Bible before, maybe you had heard the Bible, maybe you were a, a, a religious leader in the synagogue at that time. What would that be like to have these two missionaries come into your town and say, hey, we're here to proclaim the word of the Lord and we're going we're gonna to pray for the sick and they're going to be healed and we're going to cast out demons and people that have been in bondage are going to be set free. And I, th- I would think that most people would be like, okay, that's a little weird. We, we've never seen that before, but wh- why don't you try it and let's see how this goes and, and see uh, all of a sudden it begins to happen. Wouldn't you think the people would rise up in great support? And some did, but some didn't. And you know what's interesting is that Jesus prepares them. You're going to go into some cities and some towns and they're just going to reject you straight up and they want nothing to do with you. Can, Can you imagine that? What if someone came into Baxter, Minnesota and was wanting to pray for the sick and cast out demons and proclaim the name of God? And you're like, nah, no thanks. I don't want anything to do with that. My grandma's sick, my brother's sick, everybody's sick, and this guy's got demons. He's burping up demons over there. But, hey, 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 yeah, you guys go your own way. But let's ask ourselves the question. Because if they didn't want it, why not? Because we think that we're different, and that's the problem. Is that we look around us and, and we wonder why the world doesn't want to receive some of these things, even though the only reason you're there is to set the captives free and bring them to know Jesus. You're only there to help the hurting and the wounded and re- reach the lost with the message of the gospel, and yet they reject it because they just don't want it. You know, maybe some of the reasons they rejected it is because it went against everything they were taught. Maybe some of the reasons they rejected it is because it didn't fit in their box. And when God himself was in the flesh coming into their city wanting to do things and they said, no, thanks. You don't fit in our box. 
You can't heal on the Sabbath. You can't do those things here. You're messing with our system. And inside of our system, we feel safe. But on the other side is actually the answers we say we've been looking for. And you know what's crazy is that they had excuses then and they had reasons then for why they didn't want Jesus himself to come into their town and do miracles. But I guarantee you none of their reasons were good. And none of their reasons, if they could look back on themselves, would they be able to say, oh man, I wish we, I, I wish we would have rejected Jesus every time. I think they'd look back and say, what were we thinking? What were we thinking? Because we hardened our hearts. We hardened our hearts because this guy didn't fit in our box. And because we wouldn't let him do anything, this person died from an illness. And that person is still struggling with demonic things. Because we wouldn't allow God himself to do something out of our box. Yeah, you can say amen to that. I'm not throwing darts at at different denominations. I'm just saying we build boxes that weren't there because of God. We build boxes and we put them there. And the problem is, is the people that suffer the most are the people that need healing and freedom and Jesus. And the problem is, is that we keep them from finding Jesus because of our own religious mindset. We have a religious mindset that says, no, that might offend somebody. Really? Really? Yeah, it might offend somebody, and so I'm not going to let you come in here and heal this person. I'm not going to let you come in here and set this person free. And we have our reasons, and they sound really good to us, but all we're doing is causing those people to suffer because we choose to live in a religious box that we built, not Jesus. I know there's people that disagree with me, and that's fine. You're going to do your own thing. There were many people in that day that believed they were right too, and they did their own thing. I didn't come here to convince religious people. I came here because there's people that need healing. There's people that need freedom. There's people that need a Savior. And I'm not going to waste my time trying to convince the critics and the people that want to come against it because it doesn't fit in their box. Because I came to heal those that need it. I came to kick out the demons for those that need freedom. I came to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dying world that is going to hell and they need a savior. When I was a little boy and I I was old enough to read, I remember flipping through the pages of this book. Man, this book has never gotten old, even though I am. (laughs) And you're like, yeah, right. (sighs) I just got the senior discount at Perkins. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not that old. I'm just kidding. But I remember reading through these words, and I'm not making fun of anyone. I grew up in the church. My dad is a pastor, and he's a good man. But I grew up in a church that did not believe in these things. I grew up in a denomination that said, yeah, he used to do this, but we're not so sure he does it anymore. And I would read this book and say, but that's not what it says. And I would look at this book and this desire began to rise in me. I didn't know any Greek. I didn't know any Hebrew. I'd never been to seminary. I didn't know. All I knew was there was a fire burning in my heart that said, God, I want to see people see your glory and come to know you and people become free. Because what I'm growing tired of is people that preach sermons and then nothing happens. I grow so weary of that. Because we did not come for a powerless gospel. We came with a demonstration of his power. And you know what's crazy is that as I I began to get older, I began to pray prayers that I I didn't regret them. But as soon as I prayed them, I went, oh, crap. (laughs) I don't know what you're going to do with this, God. I would say stupid things like, wherever you want me to go, I will go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it, Jesus. Here I am. Send me. 
I remember coming home to my parents' home when I was 16, 17 years old, and I would drive home late from work, and I would park my Jeep at the bottom of the driveway, and I would get out late at night and get on my knees, and I would look up at the stars and say, God, use me. Use me. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to get from here to there, but I know that you do. Send me. I will go. And all of a sudden, things began to change. Because you see, I, I, I read what Jesus said here when he said, pray for workers. Pray for workers to come into his harvest, to go out and do these things, to reach the lost, to, to see people set free. I, I'm praying for those things still, but here's the thing. I also get to be a part of the answer to that prayer. And I'm still praying for more to come because trust me, there's so much work to be done. And what we need more than anything is a church that's finally willing to get out of a religious box and say, Lord Jesus, send me. I will go. I believe. I don't want to, I don't want you to feel ashamed. I want you to be set free because Trust me, God, God got me here by offending me multiple times. You know how many times I'm like, that's not God, that's not it. Oh, yep, that is God, I guess. Thank you. All right, Jesus, you got me again. You know how many times the Lord lovingly disciplined me and corrected me? A lot. And he's probably not done. But here's the deal. When you receive the correction for the Lord, you begin to see more of him. And you begin to see that this box you built really is a lie from the pit of hell. And the more you blow that thing down, the more you get to see God move. You see, there's ditches on both sides of the road, but ladies and gentlemen, tonight there is a harvest. And it's his harvest. And I'm asking you to pray some scary prayers tonight. Will you go? Will you go into the field that God has called you to go? Just like these people, the 72, the 12. You're not going in your authority. You're going in the authority of Jesus Christ. I'm going to prove it to you in just a minute. So hang in there with me. You see, as we begin to ask ourselves the question, why wouldn't the people receive it when they're seeing the fruit and they're hearing the testimonies? And there could be a hundred reasons that we could all come up with. But I want to ask you the question. If you're not willing to receive it, please ask yourself why. What is the roadblock that's keeping you from receiving what God wants to do? You see, what's interesting is that every, every city, every town that received these people that Jesus sent out, they experienced freedom. The captives were set free. The sick were healed because they received them. The cities that didn't receive them experienced none of it. And they probably sat on their religious stools and their religious soapboxes and defended their comfort zone because that's what they want to live in and they don't want to challenge. So get out of here, Jesus. We're going to talk about you, but we're not really going to believe in you and your word. We'd rather hide behind our well-crafted sermons and then go back to our green room. We'd rather start another Bible study where we talk about things and never see the Lord move. Ladies and gentlemen, the harvest is ripe. And we need people of God willing to say, you know what? I'm ready, Jesus. I believe that you are who you say you are. I will go. And it's going to offend some people. And that's not your goal. That's not your attention. It's just part of the deal. There's going to be some people that begin to hate you and misquote you and say horrible things about you, just like Jesus. And you're going to look at your closest friends and say, what do they say about me? But more importantly, who do you say that I am? Because they're saying I'm crazy. They're saying I'm all these things. But I'm just a broken person trying to follow Jesus with all my heart. I've made a lot of mistakes and I'm probably not done. You see, in Mark chapter 9, I want you to, to understand something. That authority was given to them by God. 
It didn't come from themselves. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. The Lord pulled them in and said, I give this to you. And this is a very interesting thing because they went into town after town and there were demons coming out and there were people being healed. And then Jesus decides to bring a couple of them up on top of a mountain where he's transfigured and he shows them his glory. And all of a sudden they see God in all of his glory. And remember, Peter opens his mouth and throws his foot in there a couple of times. And then Jesus on his way down from this incredible moment as he's coming down the mountain, I think he probably probably still looked a little bit transfigured because of what you're about to read. But it says this in the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 14. And when they came down to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Now, this is an important point because as they're coming down the mountain, it's Jesus and three of his disciples. They see the rest of the disciples down there and there's a great crowd. There's a person there that needs healing. And then there's a bunch of religious leaders there arguing with them. This is an interesting point. And Jesus is about to walk into a total crap show. And he's like, what's going on down here? We just had this incredible time up here. And you guys are down. What is happening down here? But you know, the problem is, is that this is still true today. You see, there's a young boy here. I'm just going to read this verse for you and then we'll come back to it. It says, and immediately all the crowd, when they saw Jesus, they were greatly amazed. And they ran up to him and they greeted him. That's why I think he probably still looked a little bit like on his glory side. And he asked them, what are you guys arguing about with these people? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a demon that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And before we we read on and fully explain the ending thing, I just want to point out the fact that that scenario has repeated so many times throughout history. Not obviously not Jesus coming down off the mountain transfigured. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that every time you find somebody that really has a need, there's a few things that come with it. There's usually a crowd that wants to see and spectate what's happening, what's going on over here. And then there's some religious people that like to come along and tell the one person that's trying to help them that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> No, this doesn't fit in our box. You can't do that. No, Jesus doesn't heal today. Jesus doesn't kick out demons today. Don't do that. That all died 2,000 years ago. And the problem is, is the person that pays the price is the little boy that still has a demon. And in the midst of all this ridiculous arguing, in the midst of all of this junk going on, there's a little boy with a real need and he needs to be set free. And the disciples, I, b- before you throw any shade on these guys and be like, dude, seriously, you didn't have any belief? I, I, let, me, let me get there for a second. They, this, this father brought his son and he said, hey, will you please kick this demon out? I've heard stories and if there's anything you can do. And I'm pretty sure the disciples were like, yeah, man, we just got back from Capernaum and we got testimonies for days, baby. We saw lots of demons come out. Hey, come out. Hey, come out. Wait a second. Why isn't this one coming out? I said, come out. Okay, let's try it in Greek. I don't know Greek. So, ha come out. <laughs> you know what I think happened? Is I think the disciples were just as surprised as everybody else. Because they thought, this isn't going to be any different than what we have just been experiencing. Going into these cities and towns and and seeing demons come out in the name of Jesus. And they prayed and said, come out in Jesus' name. And it wouldn't come out. And that's when the religious people walk in. Hey, hey, hey. So let's open our Bibles here for a second. Let me give you a little lesson here. In all the reasons I believe that stuff died 2,000 years ago. And, and you're saying this wrong. And, and the Holy Spirit doesn't do that when you say it. And you're just a bunch of hypocrites. That's what religious people do. Now, before we get angry at them, remember this. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. 
I'm not justifying them. I'm not justifying it. Because listen to me, I used to be them. I used to be that guy that was like speaking in tongues, really? Uh, It sounds like you're just saying the same syllable over and over again. If that was a real language, well, well, how come you can't understand? I was that guy until God offended me. And I went into a room by myself and I knelt on the ground and I said, Jesus, if this is real, will you give it to me now? And the spirit of God gave me a beautiful gift. But here's the thing. It came because I was offended. I was offended. And I was like these scribes and Pharisees. I was ready to get my Bible out and hit them over the head and be like, what y'all doing, you bunch of hypocrites? This isn't for today. This isn't the real thing. And the problem was is that I was hiding behind my box of comfort because I was scared if what they were doing was true. It meant that I had to come out of my comfort zone. And if I have to come out of my comfort zone, it's a little scary because I've never experienced that before. And I just got to tell you that when you try to do something for Jesus, meaning you're trying to help someone that really needs help, you're praying for them to be healed, or you're telling a demon to come out, there's always a crowd, and there's always religious people coming along to tell you, yeah, I told you that wouldn't work. Told you, you don't have enough whatever. I told you, I told you. And they begin to argue with you, and the whole time... This sick boy with a demon is paying the price. We have to be careful not to get caught up in religious arguments and stay focused on the harvest. We have to be careful not to get caught up in religious arguments and stay focused on the harvest because we don't do this for the scribes and Pharisees. We're coming to those that need and want Jesus and they're saying, I want this. Come on. Just as there were whole cities that would reject this kind of ministry, Jesus said, walk away, walk away, shake the dust off your feet and keep going. He didn't say hate them and bash them and smash them. He said, shake the dust off and walk away for they're rejecting me, not you. They're rejecting what I'm trying to do in their lives. I'm trying to meet their needs and show them that I am God, but they don't want it. They would rather have a version of me that they invent on their own because that feels more safe. That is good preaching. Whoever said that, I agree with you. Amen. You see, I can say this because I was this. I can say this because I was this. I was the judging person that came and said, this isn't real, it's not working. And then I was the critical person that was like, if you really believe in healing, then how come you're not marching to the hospital? And if why doesn't it work every time then? And how come this person had a great faith? I was that person. And then God offended me. And he changed me. And he gave me a heart of compassion for his people. And instead of focusing on all the religious arguments, I just started doing what he asked me to do. You see, what's interesting is in the midst of it all, it's the ones that are sick that want it, that get lost in the mix because they're covered by the loud voices of the religious people that don't want to come out of their comfort zone and they build lots of arguments. But I want you to hear this. Critics will judge, but teachers will mentor. Critics will judge, but teachers will mentor. You see, I learned this from a friend of mine named Rubens Cunha. When you, re- when you receive opposition from a religious force, you double down. <laughs> That's how we roll. When people come and say, oh, that healing didn't work too bad, you just say, I'm going to pray twice as much, buddy. We're doubling down because I want to reach this person, and I'm not going to allow the cloud of religiosity to stop this person that is actually hungry from Jesus receiving what they're asking for. You see, a religious spirit is the one that mocks those who are actually trying to help others. So if you ever find yourself doing that, just repent. Just say, whoops, I messed up, Jesus, I'm sorry. 
I don't want to I don't want to be that person. I don't want to come against the people that are actually trying to help others. And even if they're not doing it perfectly, they're doing something. And the problem with critics is they like to sit on their couch and coach the quarterback who's on their TV. And they like to come up with all this stupid stuff. And the person that's actually doing it is the only one that's trying we got to be careful that we do not fall into a religious mindset where we begin criticizing those that are saying, I'm stepping out of the boat. It might not be pretty. It might be a little ugly. I might make some mistakes. I might use some, some vocabulary that isn't perfect, but I'm the one getting out of the boat. So you can criticize me from the shore, but I'm the one that's going to walk on water in the name of Jesus. You see, this little boy had been tormented for a long time. And I, I hate it that this is true. Demons don't care how young you are, how old you are. They don't care your gender. They don't care your race. They have one thing on their minds. How can we destroy you? You know what brings me to tears many times, especially overseas, is there's little children that will come. And I've seen many kids manifest demons at six or seven years old. I've even seen it as young as four years old where they'll manifest the demon. But listen to how this thing got there. Their parents would dedicate them to an idol when the kid was born. They'd literally take the child, cut the umbilical cord, and put him on the altar and dedicate this child to Satan. We face that stuff because it's real. And I don't care what the Pharisees here have to say. I care about that kid that needs freedom. The Pharisees and the religious people can criticize all they want. You can go have your own party, but I'm coming for that kid that was dedicated to Satan, but he wants Jesus. You, you saw that video for Burundi earlier, and there's so many testimonies. I wish we had time to share, but one in particular that fits this moment is there was a lady that came up, and she said a witch doctor put a curse on her, and she was slowly going blind every day. And so she went to a doctor and said, help me, I'm losing my sight. So the doctor gave her medicine, and she took it home, and she used it all up, and nothing had changed. She was still losing her sight, and she went back to the doctor and said, it's not not working. I don't want to go blind. You got to help me. And the doctor said, this is spiritual. I can't do anything for you. So she came to the crusade and it was not the religious people that set her free. It was not the religious critics sitting on their couches at home, criticizing that set her free. You know who set her free? Jesus Christ. But here's the deal. Jesus wants you or he wouldn't tell us to pray for more workers. He doesn't say, I need a little more workers to be seeker sensitive. He's saying, I need more workers with the boldness to go out there and not have the fear of man and go and do the stuff. He wouldn't say, uh, pray for more workers for the harvest if that's not what he meant. And he said, this is how you're going to do it. Go and pray for the sick, kick out the demons, and tell them I am Jesus Christ. You know what happened to that lady? From the stage, we prayed a prayer and we said every generational curse and all forms of witchcraft be broken now in Jesus' name. And just so you know, that's happening right now as we speak. Yeah, a, a, amen. But, but check this out. The moment the words were spoken, her eyes opened. 
And she came on the stage and started crying as she shared her testimony. You know why she was crying? It wasn't just because she got her eyesight back. She was crying because she had lived her whole life in fear of the witch doctors. She lived her whole life in fear of the power of enemy and the powers of darkness. And now she experienced a power that was far greater than any form of darkness. And it set her free. Ladies and gentlemen, she wasn't just set free with her eyesight. She was set free from the spirit of fear that held her in bondage to the powers of darkness. Man, once you know who Jesus is, you don't waste your time being afraid of the enemy. Because when I read this book, I actually believe it when it says, Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I believe it when it says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper, for this is the inheritance of the children of God. And I actually believe it when it says that you will cast out demons in the name of Jesus. You know what's interesting to me is that the critics have never done it. So please stop getting your information from critics. (laughs) Go find a mentor. Go find a teacher that will teach you. Because someone that just wants to criticize this, they cannot show you how to do this. They're going to stay in their comfort zone and they want company. They want your company. And let's not be angry at them because we've all done it, right? We're probably all living in some form of comfort zone we need to get out of because then we experience more of God. All right, let's keep reading. So Jesus comes down the mountain and he looks at them and he says, what are you guys arguing about? And the disciples, I think they were surprised. I think they came to Jesus and were like, we don't understand what's happening. It was working all the time. What happened now? And this, this dad comes up to Jesus and he says, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a demon that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and he grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they couldn't. And Jesus answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell to the ground, and he rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And the, the father said, from his childhood. So we know this is not a small kid. This is a big kid, at least. He's probably a teenager. And I want to remind you, the devil doesn't care about your age. And as we continue to read in verse 22, and it is often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. So if you want to waste your time in religious arguments while a demon is trying to destroy this precious child, you go for it. But this is where I'm going. I'm going over here to help this kid. And so Jesus says this. I lost my place. And it says, he often cast him in the fire. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. You know, what's interesting is, didn't this guy believe enough to at least ask? Didn't he believe enough to at least bring his child to Jesus? Even after he saw the disciples not able to do, get the job done? Wasn't this guy still having a little bit of faith to come to Jesus? So why is Jesus criticizing this guy? And I want you to understand something. I don't think Jesus is criticizing him. I think he's so tired at this point of people not believing who he is. You keep coming to me and asking for things while your heart is filled with doubt that I can't do it. Why don't you come to me in faith? Saying, God, I need you. Help me. And Jesus looks at him and says, what do you mean, if you can? All things are possible to him who believes. Now, this is where you look at your neighbor and say, don't get weird on me. Thank you. Don't get weird on me. You see, some people take, they take this verse and they say, great, 
I believe. And when I was a kid, I read that verse. When it, the, the verse that says, if you have faith as small as a mustard, so you can tell the mountain to jump in the water. Well, guess what? I grew up in Colorado. So I, I remember the day where I read that verse. I marched my little butt outside onto our deck and I looked at Pike's Peak and I said, in the name of Jesus, jump in the lake. That's a true story. And then it didn't happen. In the name of Jesus. What are you still doing there, mountain? I said, get over there. <laughs> you see, the problem is, is that we, we have faith. We, we get out of the boat and we make some mistakes, right? It, what I didn't understand is that Jesus wasn't saying, if you believe, you can do whatever you want to do. What he was saying is, if you believe, anything I ask you to do becomes possible. And here's the deal. If I tell you to do this, it's possible. You just need to believe. That's why I don't have a self-serving faith that says, because the disciples walked on water, I'm going out to Gull Lake right now, and I'm going to walk on that water because I have so much faith. That is not how faith works. Faith is obedience and trust in God. Faith is not a self-serving word to get whatever you want. Faith says, God, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe your promises are true, and I open my heart to receive them. And God, whatever you ask me to do, I will be obedient. It might not be pretty, but I will be obedient. <laughs> you know what's really cool about God is that he is so patient with us. I can only imagine what he was like sitting in heaven, looking down on me as a little boy, standing on my parents' deck, yelling at that mountain. He's probably like, hey, guys, that's precious, isn't it? <laughs> but you know what I don't think he was? I don't think he was disappointed. I think he was proud. Because he was saying, there's someone that's trying to figure this out. It's not perfect but they're getting out of the boat. And so Jesus says, bring the boy here. And he looks at it. And when the demon sees Jesus, it begins to flail about and try to kill the kid. And, and just let me take one moment to say, for those of you in this place that think witchcraft is okay, I'm begging you, repent. I'm begging you. That junk has no place in your life because when you open the doors to the demonic, their only goal is to kill you. That's their only goal. They want to torment you, make you miserable, and kill you. That's their goal. Don't give them an open door. And so Jesus looks, and he doesn't think the demon out of the person. He opens his mouth, and he says this, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing terribly, the demon came out, and the boy fell to the ground like a corpse, so that most of them said, Is he dead? You know what's crazy is this scene was so dramatic because the demon didn't want to give up what it had control over. But when it came out at the name of Jesus, that boy was exhausted. That boy looked dead because he had been demonized from his childhood. You still want to get in a religious argument with Pharisees and those people? Because if you do, you're going to miss this. You're going to miss someone that actually wants and needs Jesus. So let's forget that noise. Let's not worry about the crowd that's coming to spectate. Let's just do the work of the ministry and go after the harvest. Because those people, they need Jesus. And there's people here tonight that need Jesus. The disciples were rightfully confused and they came to Jesus and they said, why couldn't we drive this thing out? And I love Jesus' response in the book of Matthew. He says, after the, G after the disciples came and said, why couldn't we cast it out? Jesus says to them, because of your little faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So let me just ask you a question. Didn't they have enough faith to try? So it's not an issue of trying the first time because I actually think they tried and I actually think they believed it was going to happen. And when it didn't happen, they were surprised. 
And I don't think that the problem was that the initial thing, they forgot to say the right words. I don't think they forgot to speak it in Hebrew instead of Greek. I don't think it was that they forgot to pray for 12 hours before they did it. Jesus says, your little faith, you want to know what I believe? It's because they quit the first time a demon said, nope, I'm not coming out. And the moment the darkness responds and says, no, I'm not coming out, we begin to pull back and go like, oh, crud, what do I do now? And instead of engaging in a fight, we begin to pull back. And I've just got to tell you that the, the faith that I believe Jesus is talking about is not a faith that says, I'm willing to start. It's a faith that's willing to persevere. It's a faith that's willing to say... This is, this is so important. I need you to hear this. Just because you believe doesn't mean the victory is instant. Just because you believe does not mean that you get it immediately right there. Sometimes there's a fight that ensues. And unfortunately, we are more like the disciples where we quit when it's not working and it's not going our way. And then the, the critics come and the crowd comes and we look stupid and silly. And what are we going to do? We're not smart enough to argue with them. And, and the crowd is coming and, and they're posting things on Facebook and all this crazy stuff. And all the while, all we need to do is ignore that and focus here and press in. You know what's interesting? I've never met a demon that doesn't come out in the name of Jesus. It's it's never happened. You know what? You want to know something else that's even cooler? I I think this is even cooler. I've never met a demon that could kick the Holy Spirit out of me. (laughs) I think that's amazing. You know why that is? Because it's not a contest. It's not a contest. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. And if you've given your life to Jesus, that's true for you. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Don't get caught up in this. Don't get caught up on that. Focus here. Because all that distraction is just trying to keep you from reaching the people that need Jesus. Amen. Where's the, where, who was that guy? That's good preaching. Where you where you at? That's what I, that's it, man. I'll pay you afterwards. <laughs> you see, sometimes proof that you believe is found in your persistence. Proof that you believe is found in your persistence. The enemy might bring his resistance. But the proof that you believe is found in your persistence. Where are the men and women of God that will rise up and pray? And even though it doesn't happen right away, they stay on their knees and they keep praying. And they come out and check. Has God answered the prayer yet? Nope, I'm going back in, back on my knees to pray. Where are the people of God that will say, victory is on the horizon. I will not quit. I will not back down. I'm going for the victory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So we have a verse I want up on the screen. I told you I would prove this to you. Because unfortunately, some of us have been taught wrongly. And please don't throw darts at anybody. Because we... A lot of us, we believe what we were taught and they were... They believe what they were taught and they just don't know. But tonight, we're going to get out of the comfort zone. You want to know why? Because almost every church I've ever been to There's people that come up to me afterwards and they pull me aside and say, I am so embarrassed, but I hear voices in my head and I have hateful thoughts that I know they're not mine, but I can't get rid of them. And people come up to me and say, there's torment happening in my head and I can't be free and I'm embarrassed to tell anyone because I gave my life to Jesus and and they're going to think that I'm some horrible, evil person, but but, but I I don't know what to do. And there's people struggling with major suicidal thoughts and, and they know it's not originating from them, but they don't know what to do to get free. And you know the reason they can't do anything is because the religious people refuse to believe and these people are living under a religious system of people that want to stay in the comfort zone and keep people in the comfort zone because then it keeps everybody safe and the people that suffer are the people that need jesus (laughs) 
So I want you to hear this. We're going to put a verse up on the screen. So this is straight from the mouth of Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Ladies and gentlemen, he's not talking about his disciples. He says, whoever believes in me. You see, you need to understand that the the way you cross the bridge from here to there is by believing and doing. Because Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's an act of discipleship where you get your hands dirty and you make some mistakes, but you're at least trying to do something for Jesus. He's not scared of you making a mistake. He's not worried about you being perfect, but he is asking you to believe. He's asking you to believe. And I want that verse to stay up there for a second. Because here's what we love to do as human beings. is We read verses like this and we instantly want to bring it back into our comfort zone. And we build theological arguments to say, that's not what he meant. That's not really what he said. I mean, that no, that's not what he said. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason people in Burundi were set free is because somebody believed in that verse. And you want to know who those people were? Dave Howard, Angie, Megan, Nikki, Em and Welly. They got out of their chicken zones. And they stopped worrying about the crowd and the critics. And they started focusing on this. You see, you might say, but... I've prayed for someone and and they didn't get healed. They died. Okay, keep praying. Go find someone else and keep praying. You know how many people I've prayed for that died? A lot. But you know what? There's been a lot more that got healed. But listen to me. I am not the one that healed them. I'm just the one that believed. And here's the thing we need to understand. And uh, one more time, look at your neighbor and say, don't get weird on me. (laughs) Is you need to understand this. Belief has access to things that unbelief doesn't. Some of you have heard me say that before. Belief has access to things that unbelief does not. The day I chose to believe that demons are coming out in Jesus' name, they just started showing up. I didn't have to go looking for him. You know, I was sitting outside Caribou Coffee one day, and this guy came up front and manifested a demon, and I stood up and put my hands on his chest, and Jesus' name, come out right now. And he instantly was set free. You don't have to go to Africa, man. It's right here. And you know why it's right here? Because people glamorize demonic stuff and they think it has to be this big movie picture thing. But let me ask you a question. Is it possible that demons can torment you? And the answer is yes. They torment you sometimes with depression, sometimes with anxiety. I'm a counselor. Trust me. I know the difference when someone has a medical actual imbalance versus when it's demonic. I know when it's a result of someone that just needs to eat something they're not allergic to versus it's demonic. We all understand that not everything is demonic, right? But there is stuff that is. And you're not going to cure that with a pill. You're not going to cure that with a counseling session. You're only going to cure that if you believe in the name of Jesus. So who do you say that he is? Who do you believe that Jesus is? And do you believe that verse? For he says it twice in a row to say, do you hear me? Truly, truly, I say, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Now, some of us like to get prideful about this and we say, no, no, I, 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 I want to. It's all about me and my great faith. That's the moment you've lost sight of this. 
You are not given faith so that people would think great things of you. You are given faith to help that boy that's been tormented from his childhood that needs freedom because this demon is throwing him into the fire. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. It's the harvest is plenty. There's no shame here. The enemy attacks everybody. I'm just going to tell you this so you understand what I'm saying. Before I went to Tanzania the first time, I was overwhelmed with fear. Overwhelmed. I would, I did the, the politically correct thing and I stacked the deck to tell people so that they would tell me not to go to Tanzania. I made it sound really good like, yeah, it's not going to be this and this. And they're like, yeah, you really shouldn't go. Thank you. That's what I needed to hear because I don't want to go. But then I'd walk away and the Holy Spirit would bring a deep conviction. And I couldn't shake it until finally I realized that that fear was demonic torment. And so I opened my mouth and I said, spirit of fear, get away from me in Jesus name. I felt something leave. That doesn't mean I was possessed and flailing around. It just means that they come to torment. They come to tempt. Did they, did the devil not himself come to tempt Jesus? But Jesus conquered it, didn't he? You see, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to the temptation. And we have to understand the enemy is real and he's checking your perimeter on how he can destroy you. And maybe he's destroying you by making you believe that God doesn't still do this. If I believed that, if Dave believed that, Angie, Megan, and Nikki then there'd still be a lot of demons hiding out in Burundi. Because the answer is that faith has access to things that unbelief doesn't. I've never walked up to someone and had a whole bunch of unbelief that it's not going to work and surprise, it came out. It comes from, I'm a little bit scared, I'm a little bit nervous, but come out in Jesus' name. No, I'm not coming out. No, you're coming out in Jesus' name. No, I'm not coming out. Out. And then they go. Guys, I've had people slither on the floor like snakes and do crazy, crazy things. And the the number one thing is that Jesus wins every time. Every time. But I want you to look at this verse and I need you to understand something. You will not experience this if you take this verse back into your comfort zone. You will not experience this if you bring it back into your box because the moment you do that, you make excuses for why this doesn't apply to today or why it doesn't apply to us. And the people that will suffer are the people that need workers to rise up and go into the harvest and show the love of God. They're not looking to to have a big show or a big name. They just want to reach the harvest for Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm asking you tonight to believe. Jesus asked these people to walk with him so that they could walk like him. And so before we, just so you know, don't leave. We're going to have a great night tonight. We're going to pray for healing. Then we're going to have the prayer lines come. Just so you know, there was people healed last night that didn't testify. The, the God was doing things that we haven't even heard about yet. There were people set free from torment. So I'm just going to ask you a question. We're going to do something that's out of a lot of people's comfort zones. Will you hang in there with me for just a few minutes? Because on the other side of this, we're still going to pray for healing. We're still going to do all the stuff, okay? And don't leave because when you go through these prayer lines, it's going to impact your life. Trust me. It's going to be good. But ladies and gentlemen, I did not come to you tonight with words, but with a demonstration of the power of the gospel. Because I believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And here's the first question I want to ask you. If you don't know that Jesus Christ is your savior, tonight I want to ask you to make a decision. To make him your Lord your Savior, and receive His forgiveness. Because He can set you free. And you know all that's holding you back from the forgiveness of your sins 
You know, all that's holding you back from being made new and born again and having an eternal destiny to live with God? It's belief. That's all it is. A decision to say, I choose to believe that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to perish on a cross and rise again that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. All that's keeping you back from that is making a choice to believe. It's not always a feeling. It's a decision. I choose to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And maybe you've come here tonight and you say, there's, there's no way God could forgive me because I went to church and I went to confirmation, but I've been doing horrible things. And then I come back to God and, and then I do horrible things. And he's probably sick of me. He's probably tired of me. And I'm too screwed up for God to do anything with. First thing you need to do is you need to believe that what God says is true. That there's nothing you could do to make him love you more. And there's nothing you could do to make him love you less. Because the worst sinner on the earth, Jesus still died for him. Because Jesus loves that person. And maybe you've come to this place and you say, I just, I I feel the hatred like the church hates me. I feel like God hates me. Let tonight be the night that you experience the love of God instead of the lies of the enemy. Because God does not hate you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. But you see, God is a jealous God. And he doesn't like us coming along and saying that Jesus is one of many ways. He says, I am the truth. I am the way. And I am the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. And what Jesus is saying is, if you want a relationship with me, you have to believe that. That means I'm asking you to repent from witchcraft. I'm asking you to repent of spiritualism. I'm asking you to repent from all of those other things. And I'm asking you tonight, will you leave the world behind and walk an aisle and give your life to Jesus? Though none go with me, still I will follow. Come on, someone. I have decided to follow Jesus.